the homily for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. Today, my dear friends, we read in the Gospel of the controversy that the Pharisees made about the observance of the Sabbath, a controversy that is kept alive today by some Protestant groups and denominations, and which leads us to discuss the keeping of the Lord's Day and its proper significance. The first question that we need to answer is this, why do we keep the Lord's Day on Sunday? The, the obvious and short answer is, first, because this is the tradition of the Church, and second, because this is the day where our Lord rose again from the dead. I say first because this is the tradition of the Church, because we need no more uh, explanation other than that. If the Church established by God tells us that this is the Lord's Day, then it's as simple as that, and we can accept it. But the Church wants us to know the reason for everything that is commanded to us. And so the reason for that is that our Lord rose again on this day, and therefore the Christians, for the Christians, this is the Lord's Day. Now, let's, uh, let's delve into this a little bit more and understand it a little bit more deeply. You know that God created the world in six days. Let's go back all the way to the story of creation. The Bible tells us that God rested on the seventh day. This needs to be understood as on the seventh day God completed and ceased his creative action. Now we say that creation was complete at that time, but we're referring to the material creation. If we refer to the supernatural creation, the creation of grace, this was not yet completed. Because we know that God still wanted to give us many great gifts. He wanted to give us even more grace. He wanted to give us the sacraments. He wanted to give us a perfect sacrifice to honor him. How this would happen in the future is something that is to be determined. But we know that it had not come at that time. And so we can truly say that God had completed the material part of creation but the supernatural part of creation was still to be completed when our Lord would come. It was then to our Lord Jesus Christ that it pertained to complete this part of creation, the, supernat the supernatural part of creation, which he did when he came and through his death and passion, he gave us the church, he gave us the sacraments, he completed the revelation and he completed all the gifts that God wanted to give us in grace. So this can be considered in a certain way as another day of work, you could say, where God finished his creation, a new creation. And this was completed, as you know, on the resurrection of our Lord. When he rose again from the dead on Sunday, that was the, com the completion of the redemptive work of Christ. A new creation. So this, the end of this new creation, became the Lord's day from now on, from then on. Now, a question might come, can we prove this from the Bible? Meaning, can we prove them from the Bible that Christians, Catholics, are supposed to worship God on Sunday, on the first day of the week? The answer is yes. If you look at the Acts of the Apostles, which is the book that tells us what happened after the ascension of our Lord, it's very clear in there. We read in chapter 20, verse 7, On the first day of the week, when we were assembled for the fraction of the bread, Paul discoursed with them, and he continued his speech until midnight, they say. So they say, on the first day of the week, when we were assembled for the fraction of the bread. Now, the fraction of the bread is how they named what we now call the Mass. And this you can see from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, 42, when they say the faithful persevered first on the doctrine of the Apostles, second on the communion of the fraction of the bread, and in prayers. So the fraction of the bread was the Mass. And we read, again, in the other verse, we read that the, the fraction of the bread, the Mass, was done on the first day of the week. We also prove this from the letters of the Apostles in Paul. The Apostles in Paul uh, wrote to the Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians, and he was instructing them on how they were going to do the collections. They were to do a collection so that the, the people delegated by St. Paul could take it with them for the poor. 
And he says, On the first day of the week, let every one of you put apart the collections. From this, it's obvious that even back then, alms were collected during Mass for the poor, and also that the faithful would gather on the first day of the week, and no other, because that was the only day where they could gather the collections from everyone. Now, if this wasn't enough, when you read the writings of the first Christians, of Tertullian, of St. Justin, they all agree that the Christians would gather on the first day of the week. Now, this is from the New Testament. But if we go back even in the Old Testament, in the prophecy, one of the most beautiful prophecies about the resurrection of our Lord, it is said to us that that would become the Lord's day. It is Psalm 117. And this was written 1,000 years before Christ by the prophet, the King David. And he puts in the lips of our Lord these words. The Lord chastising hath chastised me, he refers to the passion of our Lord. But he hath not delivered me over to death. And this refers to the resurrection. And then our Lord continues. Open ye to me the gates of justice. This is the gate of the Lord, the just shall enter into it. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. Let us be glad and rejoice therein. The Lord is God, and he hath shown upon us, appoint a solemn day, and bring your sacrifice to the very altar. Now very clearly it is said to us in this psalm, that the day when our Lord rose from the dead, is the Lord's day. This is the Lord's doing. This is the day which the Lord hath made. Let us be glad and rejoice therein. So, we can certainly prove that this day, the, the Sunday, is according to God, according to the Old Testament, according to the New Testament, the Lord's day. Before I continue with the sermon, I want to tell you a story that speaks about the reverence that we ought to have in church, and particularly the reverence that we ought to have on this day, on Sunday. There was a king in Japan who was obviously raised as a pagan, but then the missionaries came and they converted him to Catholicism and he became a very fervent Catholic. Now, you, feel, you must remember that in Japan, there's a whole different culture and particularly, they put a big emphasis on respect. Even nowadays, if you go to Japan, you'll see people bowing to, the, to, to each other, bowing especially to the elder, so that, that has always been a big aspect of their culture. Now this king became Catholic. And one day they came and announced to him that some of his uh, subjects had been disrespectful during Mass. So the king was filled with great anger, with great zeal, you could say, and he called for the offender. The offender came, the person that had been disrespectful, the king asked him if this was true. He said yes. And then the king condemned him to death. Everybody present gasped. They all were astonished. How could this be? Uh, some of the advisors came to the king and he, they said, uh, my, my, my master, my lord, this is too great of a punishment for such a little fault. And the king, uh, he was lucky not to be beheaded himself because the king looked at him uh, very, very uh, surprised. And he said to him, what, are you, what do you say? Do you call it a small offense to be guilty of disrespect in the presence of the great God of heaven? If that servant hath shown the same disrespect in my presence, would you not say that he deserved the most severe chastisement? And yet what am I compared to the, with, with the eternal king of heaven? The king said. It is true, if a servant had been disrespectful in front of the king there in Japan at that time, he would have been beheaded. And so the king actually made a good point. But obviously that's not the spirit of Catholicism. And the servant was spared at their petition and probably at the petition of the priest. But this was a lesson for all who learned of it. And in the future, in that kingdom, many years afterwards, it was never known that anyone would be disrespectful in the church during the Holy Sacrifice, and especially 
on Sundays. To continue with our sermon, we said then that we celebrate Sunday as the Lord's Day because this is the day when our Lord rose again from the dead. It is because of this that baptism would be given on Easter Day, on Sunday, because baptism was our own resurrection, our own rebirth. And because of that, the Sunday, each Sunday of every, every Sunday of the week, became the day where you would remember baptism. You would remember your own resurrection. That is the origin of the Asperger ceremony, where the church, the Latin church, in every Sunday, you have the priest that goes with holy water, sprinkling the people. And that ceremony is supposed to remind you of your baptism. So that every Sunday when you receive the, the holy water, you're supposed to be reminded of that day when you were reborn. So knowing all these things, it is important for us to ask us now, what is the purpose of Sunday? What does God want me to do? You know the answer to this, I'm sure. You remember from your catechism. Sunday is, first of all, the first purpose of this, is that we worship God. On Sunday, we are obliged to give thanks, to adore, to render our services, our adoration to God. So the worship of God is the first uh, purpose, the first object of Sunday. The second purpose of Sunday is linked, as we said, to baptism, because it is supposed to be a day of spiritual regeneration, a day of renovation for us, especially through prayer, through religious instruction, through coming to Mass, through having mental and bodily peace. So the second purpose of Sunday is our own spiritual renovation. And this brings to us the third aspect of Sunday, rest. Rest is absolutely necessary to obtain the other purposes that we mentioned, to be able to worship God and to be able to renew ourselves spiritually. I believe that we all know that on Sunday we must abstain from servile work, we must abstain from doing business, we must abstain from engaging in the same material or economical occupations of our usual weekdays. We should abstain in short of whatever hinders either our rest or our spiritual renovation or the worship of God. We all know those things. But I think, my dear friends, that the one thing that we don't focus on is the second aspect, the, the aspect of our own spiritual renovation. And I want to leave impressed in your minds this concept, that this is the day of rebirth, that this is the day of our spiritual resurrection, and as such we should treat it and keep it. It is not enough just to come to Mass on Sundays. The whole day must be a day for me to renew myself. But because the worth of my words is little, I would rather step aside and allow you to listen to the words of the Supreme Shepherd, the words of our Holy Father of blessed memory, Pope Pius XII. And he says, Sunday must be the day to rest in God, to adore, to beseech Him, to thank and ask God for forgiveness for the sins committed during the previous week, and to beseech Him for the graces and light necessary for the one that begins. Remember, Christian people, that Sunday is the permanent memorial of the resurrection of the Lord. And therefore, man must also rise from the dead, as it were. He must rise out of the offices, out of the shops of his labor, out of the fields, out of the trucks, out of all those places where, surrounded by the distraction of worldly things and of all those tasks of the day, he can barely raise his mind to God and pray. He can barely be concerned of the most important business of all, that is, of his salvation. Sunday, then, must be the day of bodily rest and of spiritual elevation. Not the day of excessive sports, he says. Pope Pius XII said this. Not the day of excessive sports, exaggerated pleasures, things that rather numb and stupefy the mind, even more than the regular labor of a weekday things that don't bring the soul closer to God, but rather away from Him. Is it not a reason for profound sadness that sometimes the faithful Catholics expose themselves precisely on Sundays to scenes and spe spectacles which we could call with St. Augustine a stain and pestilence to souls? 
a ruin to, honest, to honesty and decency. No, the Pope tells us. Let it be instead that Sunday becomes the day to gather the family, not to separate it. The day of spiritual sweetness, the day of devotion and adoration. That's what the Pope tells us, and that's how it should be. So let it be, my dear friends in Christ, that every Sunday we rise again spiritually. On this, the day of which we say, This is the day which the Lord hath made. Let us be glad and rejoice therein. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.